how much shit do we see on the marketplace, right? I would say probably 70 to 8% of the sports supplementation out there is shit, guys and girls. Yeah. But if you don't have a structure to follow or a program to follow, then you cannot just randomly change your diet every day, right? When you tell them your training style, they're like, fuck, this is very interesting because there's three components to it. There's a week one, there's a week two, there's a week three, and each week is different. Can you, in short, kind of break down each week? Flex Lewis, you're straight out of the land. He's a coach that expects greatness. A man that comes from humble beginnings to now top of his craft. His athletes have won the most prestigious awards in bodybuilding and his clientele are some of the most recognizable people in the world. From Bollywood to the sports entertainment, my coach of 19 years, a podcast with Neil Yoda Hill. Neil Hill, coach extraordinaire, Yoda. Welcome to Straight Out of the Lab podcast, my friend. It's been a while to get here. Yeah? Fucking had to go through like your people and book, <laughs> book fucking you. What's this been a month and a half now for this? At least. Got that done now, right? Yeah, we fucking know. The fucking request he had to walk into this gym. <laughs> fucking make sure all the staff, uh, you know, blowing trumpets. and. <laughs> but yeah, it's great to have you. You're met. Obviously, you and I have, or all three of us have, a special relationship. And it's uh, 19 years of, you know, craziness. Cra- that's the only way I could describe our relationship from all the ups and downs and Everything in between is just being a roller coaster of uh, emotions, mm-hmm. wins, losses, as I said, craziness. We went from not knowing each other to us having a coaching relationship. And I think you know how I am with, with all my diets. So imagine now driving one hour to Mr. Neil Hill's house in Tembe, and he had these. Lights that he purposely put in his kitchen. Well, that's what I think, anyway. <laughs> and they were very unforgiving. And he was prepping athletes, of course, at that point in time. Still working his full-time job. Um, and I think I got there towards the later evening because I remember standing out the, outside the lights. Your boys were probably as young as Andy, if not younger. Probably younger because they were running around in diapers. Yeah, because Chad would have probably been about four. Yeah. And Kurt would have been sort of... Uh, Two, right? Yeah, less than two. I'll we'll yeah. say there, there was maybe three and one and a half or two and maybe. Very yeah, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were one of them, if not both, were running around in diapers. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. And I got to meet them the first time. And <clears throat> we sat down at his, his uh, kitchen table and he said to me, tell me what your diet consists of right now. So, of course, I'm telling him like this. And, I remember you know, this. this is and I will a, say that your version is accurate. I know this fine. Because I've heard it many because, times. Because it's, yeah. I didn't know about the, the I thought it was my mum and dad. But anyway, that it was 19 years ago, so you have to forgive me on that. Um, but with us at this dinner table, I don't know if we had food or I brought my food down or whatever else, but I know that everything was at that point in time put away. We were sitting down. Okay, tell me about your diet. Meal one. All right, turkey. All right, meal two. Kept on looking up, nodding his head. So I kind of like, okay, I'm in my fucking groove, yeah? He wrote this whole... Pay fucking A4 size of notes, wrote things down, looks up to me and goes, this is fucking shit, <laughs> and crumpled it up and launched it over my fucking head. I was like, what the fuck have I got myself into you? <laughs> and I was like, wow, this guy's intense. So he's like, this is what I want you to do. So can you get turkey? Do they sell this at this? Do you, you know, because obviously we live in different parts of, of Wales. I want you to do this, blah, blah, blah. And he knew that I was, you know, not in the financially best spot. I mean, I I started up the company and it was just in its infancy stage. So even gas or petrol to get to Tembe was a lot of money for me, you know. Um, So we wrote everything down. I want you to get this, get that. And obviously the supplements that I I couldn't get, which was CMP at the Mm -hmm. time, shout out to Kerry Case, Mm -hmm. um, he'll give me. So it was this initial kickstart for me. I was like, okay, wow, we've got four weeks. And I just remember at the time I was in college and I was dating, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was Sarah at the time. Yeah. So this was a new endeavor for, for my little college relationship too. So every night before bed, Neil had me doing pauses. 
and isotension, which I won't leak the secrets out on. <laughs> but can you imagine being going from this rugby boy to now doing a new sport as bodybuilding? You said it's going to be done after Mr. Wales to now hiring a coach and well, it wasn't hired. You know what I mean? I was I was using a coach and having to do these ice retentions. Nineteen years, by 19 the way. Years, <laughs> 19. So I'm looking at I'm looking at this saying, okay, uh, chest. I need to do these, and I was doing all my poses in front of the mirror, and I would go to bed absolutely soaked because this stuff is no fucking joke. So I would do this every single night, every single morning, and then I would go and train, and then I would move people on top of this, and I was going to college. So it's like a full-time thing, but I was determined. I'll tell you one thing. Four weeks later, I was heavier. Seven pound heavier. And I was fucking ripped. Back to front. I will say this. From every show I've ever done, I've had glutes. The first one I had glutes, but I have had shredded glutes from from the first show to the last show of us working together. We've never missed. We've never missed. And uh, it was <laughs> it was incredibly hard. The diet was incredibly hard, but it was not as hard as what I put through myself myself on the first time because I had structure. So for me, mentally, I had this sheet to go by. I had a coach I could ask questions to, as opposed to me just doing it on my own and people saying, "Oh, eat a fucking baked potato on Tuesday," yeah. and that was it. I yeah. basically depleted. So having this structure, but when I say it was incredibly hard, is because I was adding in these new, you know, Neil Hill secrets that got me into the condition that it got me, and it's it's a blueprint from the first show till the last. Nothing's really changed other than food. You know, quantities, obviously, over the years. But if I was to take my last diet and, and my first diet, I could look at it, and it's very recognizable. You mm-hmm. could say that, hey, so, you know, this is one thing about yourself is you go by the saying, if it ain't broken, why try and fix it, right? And, of course, certain meal choices over the years because of my digestive issues and stuff, we've changed out. But pretty much it's simplicity. Mm-hmm. Kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid, the saying is. Mm-hmm. Kiss. And that's what we've we've done, right? We've we've kept uh, everything as simplistic as possible, um, but the the uniqueness that that you bring to the table is Neil Hill. Every morning, I would wake up to a text because you get up early, um, earlier than me anyway, and I would open the fucking text by, "Why aren't you up? Where's your weight? It's fucking five in the morning, you crazy <laughs> fucker." <laughs> It's fucking five in the morning. I don't care. I need your weight ASAP. Oh my god. Okay. In caps. And then, and then Sorry, I, all in, in caps. caps. Yeah, yeah. In caps, yes. You know I'm yes. serious then, right? Yeah. Yes. It's the cap. Yes. It's out of messages. I message Ali and said, Ali, send this fucker this message, please, exactly like I've written it, and yes. ask him to reply to me in the next ten minutes. <laughs> yes, exactly. But that's day one. Day uh-huh. one, we had that relationship, and over the years, of course, there was a relationship that then followed outside of of, it, of everything we've done. But for people who, who are starting in this sport and have got coaches and stuff like that, it's very hard to even have a relatable, um, I would say, relatable story. Because you truly took me from an amateur. You went through the amateur ranks, undefeated, to then turning pro, and then... 202, 212, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful story, but a lot of guys will get to a certain standard with a coach and then they'll jump ship, right? Mm-hmm. Or a coach will take them to, to the highest of their highs and then they jump ship. There's no fucking loyalty. Of course, listen, if we are going to sit you and say that our relationship has been, you know, sunshine or rainbows, no. But the understanding is that we have a rela- fantastic relationship outside of stage but then the uniqueness about us is you would obviously pre-war me and say, okay, Flax, Monday, Tuesday, whatever it is, of next week we're going to be 10 weeks out, 12 weeks out, whatever, coach hat comes on. And that's where a lot of people don't, are not able to adjust. And, and it's not, it wasn't easy for me the first couple of days because I had this ability to kind of not do what I want, but I didn't have you fucking hitting me up at 5 o'clock in the morning asking me for my weight, right? But come that Monday... When that coach hat is on, different relationship happens. And um, it's very hard for a lot of athletes that you work with to adjust to that. 
but uh, over the years, you know, I I had to uh, I had to understand and uh, that this is this is what it takes to be the best. Do you want a fucking cheerleader behind you, or you want a coach? And we, uh, you know, we've butt heads a few times over the years with. I think that the first adjustment, because you can snap straight into it. And for me, it's like, okay, I'm getting to it. You know I'm going <laughs> to do it. But I'm like, I'm getting to it. But you want you want that fucking answer. You want that result. And you, you want it when, you, when you've been told or when you've been asked of it. Pictures. For us, it was every Monday and Thursday. For other athletes, it's different. And then over years, it's become Monday and Tuesday. Even though it's back to back, it was two different muscle groups that were trained, but you wanted to see what fullness I brought to their muscle groups on them days. So we would take photos on a Monday, photos on Tuesday, and because at that point in time, I think you were living in the UK too, so that's time delay. Mm-hmm. So I'd always wake up to the true answer, and she could tell you her story. You know, There's always a little bit of nerves that come with it. Even though I'd done everything to the T, I didn't cheat, didn't miss cardio, didn't miss a beat meal, whatever. I still waited for your approval. She could tell me how great I looked, but until I got it from you, that's that's what I waited for. So I remember going to bed a couple of times with, uh, you know, a little nervous, being like, "Oh fuck," you know. But um, yeah, it's it's a beautiful um, it's a beautiful relation, that's for sure. And, and uh, I guess the question that that I want to ask you is the mentality that you have. And the, dem- the 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 demand that you have from your athletes is that something that's always been there from a young age? Um, I would say yes, and the reason I say that is that I I didn't come from a comfortable family. I worked. I started work maybe when I was eight or nine. Had a little paper round on the Sunday. Parents didn't have money. Never been to a restaurant in my life with my parents. Never been to a coffee shop. In my life with my parents. Never been on holiday in my life with, with my parents. Always had second-hand clothes. I was the kid who never went on school trips because they were too expensive. I had to work. Yeah. Do you understand? And I'm not saying I had it hard because I didn't feel like I had it hard. Mm. I was an outdoor kid, right? And I'm probably, I don't want to talk about some things because they're so personal. I'll get very emotional. And I don't want to feel vulnerable. But sometimes it's important for people to understand or see the real story because they see the finished project mm-hmm. or produced or item or athlete on stage, but they have no fucking idea what it took to create that polished diamond on stage. They have no e- no no recollection. They can't imagine it. They just imagine wanting to look like that. But they have no idea about the sacrifices. They don't know that I gave you my first sponsorship contract. Mm-hmm. And I don't say these things because I'm owed anything. When we started working together, Flex, 19 years ago, it was innocence. It was never about success. Mm. It was never about money. Back then, if you were a sponsored athlete, man, you were the shit because there may be only five people or six people in the whole of the UK which is sponsored. So to be a sponsored athlete, it was an absolute privilege. When I turned pro... There was two pro cards given away in the UK. And I would say that the hardest show to win your pro card in would be the Welsh Championships. And the only reason I say that is in order to win your pro card at the British Championships, you had to wait, you had to win your weight division and you had to win the overall. So there was one pro card a year. There was no 202 class. There was no 212 class. There was no classic division. Open bodybuilding, female bodybuilding. That's all. And you had to be an IFBB athlete to win that pro card. But when they had the Open Wales on, any athlete in any federation in the world could compete in that show. So what would happen, you might be competing against a three-time professional NABA champion, a two-time NABA universe champion. Every athlete who's wanting to win a pro card, who believes in themselves at the British Championships, would be competing in that show. Yeah. And it wasn't because it was an easy show to win. It was because you had a s- two, sh- two shots of winning a pro card. Yeah. So the level of competition was just extreme, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that when we met and when this relationship was formed, it was all about 
what we could bring to the stage. Mm. You understand? It yeah. wasn't about anything else. It wasn't about anything other than the fact that I really believed in you. I'm really dyslexic and it really bothers me on a daily basis. People have, like, everybody has weaknesses, right? I don't need fame and I don't need fortune. I don't need materialistic shit. It means nothing to me. Yes, I've been given some beautiful gifts. You've given me some beautiful gifts. I don't ask for those things. I don't need them, but I really appreciate them. Yeah. All right? Very, very much I appreciate them. But for me, my passion is I have to be really good at something because I know I'm weaker in those other areas. And you know when you've done something good, right? You don't need to be applauded. You don't need to have to be recognized because you know when you've done something good. So for me, I never wanted to be that person to give somebody false dreams or false hopes. And when I saw you for the first time and I, I kind of just got taken back with what I saw and then we spoke, I never lived through your life. Mm. I never once lived for you, through your success because my success ended because of hereditary knee issue. Mm. It was never that, ever. I got pretty sad for the first few years of coaching Flex because I wanted to train with him. Mm. I didn't, I wanted to compete against him. And it wasn't about anything other than the fact that I was a bodybuilder at heart and I stepped away because of my, and I'm either 100% in or I'm 100% out. So to, to see you go through all these different layers as an athlete and achieve what you have, it's a very big prideful thing for me because it makes me feel good that, not that I did good, but I didn't say something was possible that you couldn't achieve in life. Yeah, we focus on a lot of small steps, right? We never looked like, oh my God, we're going to get this. You know, was, the next show was always our Olympia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned earlier your knees. I know you were a, a very good athlete in school, very good swimmer. Um, you touched about your, your upbringing. Obviously, we went full circle on that. But let's go back to what you originally started and talking about your upbringing, going through school and being an athlete. Because I know you were, you were a very good swimmer, along with a, a BMX rider, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sport came, I wouldn't say it came easy to me, but it did because in any sport, I never was held back with my disability. So I felt like I was... I was even. Mm. So for me, I had, to I had to be successful in those things. Um, and, it, and I wasn't a sad kid. You know, so even though you might say, hey, you sounded like emotional. I'm just saying that it's not been easy, right? Mm. And my, I, I get driven by, I have my own goals with what I'm trying to achieve. I was very successful as an international swimmer. My main stroke was breaststroke. I was an incredibly gifted surfer. I probably could have been a better surfer than a bodybuilder. But the problem about surfing is you can only get in the water when they swell. Yeah. I worked a lot of hours. When I was an amateur athlete, when I was a professional athlete, I was working two full-time jobs the whole time, working nine to five as a motor vehicle technician, working with Range Rover and Jaguar, and I'd be working in a nightclub on the door. You know, So I worked a lot of hours. And I also know I was a really good husband and I was a really good father. Mm. And I only spent four days... Four, sorry, not four days. I only trained four days a week. And I used to get in and I used to get out. So my self-expression of sport was very easy for me because I knew that my success or the outcome of that uh, sport and achievement or whatever you're doing was always going to be a relationship of your hard work. And, you know, I am a big advocator of hard work pays off. And I'm not the type of person who's willing to fail in anything that I do because I have to be 100% on it. It's not about having to be the best because not everybody can be the best. And I think some people measure success, whether it's monetary or whether it's on stage or sport and accolades or achievements, that if you don't win, you fail. Well, that means that 99.999% of people in life have failed. That's not failure. Failure is when you don't fucking apply yourself. Yeah. Failure is when you're fucking lazy. Failure is when you got fucking excuses. And failure is when you don't have enough respect to have a respect for the people which are helping you on that journey. And not one single time have you made me feel frustrated mm. with your application come contest time. Do you understand? Yeah. When have I ever had to give you a hard time about not following the diet? When have I ever had time to go out not training? When have I ever given you a hard time not doing your cardio? Mm. Never. 
I might say, yeah, get the fuck out of bed. I want you to get your cardio done at 6.30 in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. But there was a reason for it. It was because I wasn't willing to fail you. Because if I fail fucking you, I fail myself. And I couldn't, and I don't accept that. Yeah. Surfing. <laughs> I was a good surfer. I need to see, I want to see this. We got to get some footage of that stuff. No, I, I don't, there is any footage. Um, Could you still surf now? Like, no. No, I remember saying to Chad, you know, my boys, you know, they look at dad or, you know, they, every every child looks Great at their guys. father in a certain way, right? Yeah. Daddy, you used to be a good surfer, right? I said, no, I used to be a good Chad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go surfing with daddy, All right? And uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So buy him a wetsuit, buy myself a wetsuit, yeah. yeah. buy him a board. Daddy's like, watch daddy, <laughs> copy daddy. <laughs> You know, lifeboat comes out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just right. exaggerating. Yeah, okay. But that's a good story. It was, uh, I lost all my balance and all my coordination. Yeah. But yeah. the thing is about surfing is that you can only surf when there's swell. And because I work so many hours, yeah. I couldn't get in the water. All my friends and, and, and the people which were moving forward, forward in surfing were training, sorry, surfing probably like 20 times more than me. Yeah. But I was still right up there. Because it was just an, an, a natural gift for me, if that makes sense. And I love surfing, but I got frustrated of not being able to do it 100% because yeah. of my uh, inability to get into the water because I was working two full-time jobs. All you my were. friends would surf, they were in college. Yeah. So they'd get like 15 weeks of the year off, right? And, really? if, they, and if they didn't want to go to college and they wanted to surf, they would just take the day off. I couldn't, I wouldn't get paid. Yeah. Whereas with bodybuilding, I started bodybuilding when I was 19. I did my first show after 12 weeks of training. Yeah, tell us about that. Ah, I had no muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I was lean, though, because of obviously surfing and obviously my background from um, swimming. Who, who did you, who'd you work with? Or you did your own diet? I never, I never had anybody. Be, because what happened is I started training in this gym. There was a guy called John Reese who um, was a senior bodybuilder. Maybe at the time he was like 42, 43, 44, 46, I don't know. But he was doing his first ever competition. Like a master's, right? Yeah, like a yeah. master's, first ever competition. And he was like, you, you should do the show because I was the only one with abs. Mm. But I was lean. I, th I know that my body weight was nine stone three on stage. All right, what's this? And I do I, the math as he's talking. So there's, there's 14 pounds in a stone. So if you put 14 times nine and then add three, that was my body weight on stage. Wow. And I and uh, I did diet. Eighty something, maybe. One twenty nine. One twenty nine. So there was one hundred twenty. No fucking. Way. I was one hundred twenty nine, and I will find pictures somewhere because there will be pictures. <laughs> Fourteen. Times. I was. Yeah. I was nine stone three on stage. Fourteen Flex. times nine plus three. Plus three. One twenty nine. One twenty nine. That's Jesus. what I was. Only and first and I was. Show? And I was lean. It was the Mister Wales. Yeah. It was Mr. Wales uh, back in 1989. And why do I know it was back in 1889? Because in 18, 1989, I went to Rim in Italy to watch the Mr. Olympia. And I'm there with uh, three other guys that I met with in the industry, bodybuilders. Um, one of them, Mark Poole, was competing. And um, we were probably like two weeks out from the Mr. Olympia at the time. And I was so naive to everything mm. because Tembi is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. All right. Beautiful so, place, though. Oh yeah, it's a beautiful place, but it's just like isolated. Yeah. So where these guys, they lived in an area um, or trained in an area called Half and West, and um, it was just synonymous with like incredible bodybuilders. Those bodybuilders were competing in the Welsh Championships. Remember, this is all new to me. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know anything about the industry, but I did the show and I dieted really hard with the knowledge that I had. And yes, had I ever asked questions to other people? Of course I had. Yeah. But when they told me what they were doing, in my head I was like, if I only ate that, I would lose all my muscle. And I didn't have a lot of muscle. <laughs> and if I did that much cardio, I don't need to do that much cardio. Yeah. So my point is, is that why is my diets tend to be very simplistic? Because it doesn't need to be fucking complicated. Yeah. And you don't have to be a scientist to work out that if your total output in calories is over a certain point to your requirements of your total mac macronutrient, you're probably going to be catabolic. And I didn't understand about catabolism and anabolism and training and styles, all that back then. But I knew that if I was eating these five meals and I 
wasn't measuring how many grams of carbs and fats and product carbohydrate because i had no idea but i would measure my food quantities do you mm. understand even in your first show even in my first sh- in, even in my first show even in my first show because i looked at kind of what was going on in the magazines right yeah. Yeah. um and i was very fortunate that my body responded that way and then um you know that was my fir- that was you know that that was my first sex because i came second in the welsh championships as a junior bodybuilder uh, and then when i had asked advice other advice and people would tell me like I'm not going to do that. Mm. So I just concentrated on, on on doing what I felt I need to do. How many times would you say to me instantly, hey, coach, you know, such and such, you know, like, you know, they're just like, I'm not interested in what they're doing. Yeah. We, we, we don't, don't, don't matter about what, what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what they're fucking saying because they're not going to beat you on contest day, right? So it doesn't matter what they're doing or what they're saying. It's, it's completely true. irrelevant. We focus on our shit. And it's not because I knew more than their coach and I knew more than them, but it's... Well, you know what works yeah. for you. Yes. <coughs> I mean... It, 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 you know what works like, and you go on to loyalty. Loyalty can't be measured by somebody who stayed with their coach or their coach has stayed with their athlete for 19 years. Mm-hmm. Loyalty is about being honest with one another. That's where loyalty starts. And that doesn't mean by losing or switching to another coach isn't loyal. If it's not working, you've got to change it. Mm. How many times have we had a conversation about athletes who are incredible? Like, what the fuck is this guy doing? He's with the same coach, doing the same shit, getting the same results, looking shit. Mm. But he's got the potential to be incredible. That's not loyalty because if a... A coach really cares about his athletes. He will want them to do the best for themselves as long as it's done in a respectful way. I agree. Yeah. That is loyalty. Mm. I've yeah. always been honest with you. I've always been very transparent with you. Always told you what you don't want to hear. That's true. But my intentions have always been pure and very, very honest and true. It's never been anything different. No. And with our relationship, <clears throat> I would say not only as um, your methodologies throughout the years um, stay true from the get, you know. But if anything, as the years have gone on and the pressure has increased, kind of fine-tuned that knob a little bit. Because mm-hmm. not that I had any leeway when I was younger, but I was an amateur. I had, I had structure, but I didn't have structure. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And as the years got more, when I was uh, then went on to become a professional athlete, that comes with a massive amount of responsibility. You know, we all see these guys that are kind of half ass in their fucking preps or saying they're doing this, but they're doing something completely opposite. You kind of fucking, as I said, put the microscope on everything we're doing, analyze everything from sleep to, to, to meal quantity. If there's an issue with something, you want to get to the bottom of it. You know, obviously we've dealt with digestion throughout my entire career. We've tried so many different things, hired specialists and this and the other. But we never kind of give up on that, right? There was always always a new attack on trying to do something. And even with, um, I mentioned sleep, right? You you break down everything with all your athletes. And every athlete is different, you know? One guy from, you know, I just met somebody uh, from China, uh, might not have the same... Uh, sources of food that I, I do here in the USA. So you, obviously, the only adjustment that you will ever make to a diet is based on, you know, the ability of what they can get. Now, in Wales, we were very lucky that we could have a lot of fresh food, farm fr- farm to, to plate. In the US, it's a little different. I think that's one of the reasons why I picked up a lot of my, my gut issues when I moved to the United States because of, you know, just how... Crystallized shit. Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, you've got to try this shit. Everyone's <laughs> drinking in America. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, the truth is, I went to the uh, US for the first time and I came home with a fucking suitcase full of He did, everything. seriously. I'm yeah. serious. Yeah. I'm artificial. not shitting you. Like, yeah. everything artificial, right? Everything. The only thing which wasn't artificial was his muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I came back with a suitcase of fucking every shit you can think the of. The diet stuff. Everything. Yeah. I mean, I went down this aisle. I must have spent about an hour there and I went to the checkout and she was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. But when I went through customs, they had the best fun because they... They went through my bag and what the hell is it? Like I had sugar free syrup, sugar free ketchup, sugar free this, fucking. <laughs> I came with sauces. I came with everything. 
And I went home and I obviously I was like, Coach, you gotta try this. What the, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> Chris, call Crystal Light, try it. Oh. oh, it tastes good, but I don't want to. I don't, no. But yeah, it fucked me up. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it did. There's loads of stories that yeah. you can talk about, but it did fuck me up. And um, But again, the introduction of all that stuff over the years was new to us. Mm-hmm. You know? You know, not that the St. Wales is. You know, fucking third world country, but we we didn't have the luxury mm-hmm. of a lot of the stuff that they have right now, right? What I think is because people don't, people like to feel comfortable, right? Mm. Well, yeah, they don't want dieting to t- no. be any different than and that, yeah. They and, do. and dieting doesn't have to be boring, no. and it doesn't have to be uncomfortable, just because you don't have those sweet things in place. Because there is a way to manip- manipulate your food with great available natural raw, you know, yeah. ingredients yeah. and everything to create. Something which is more uh, consumable on a palate, should we say. Yeah. yeah. And with your diet plan, there was always a cheat meal involved, sometimes cheat day, mm-hmm. you know, involved in your plans. And that is an incredible reward for somebody that is busting their ass all week. Because a lot of coaches want these guys to suffer. You can have a high carb day on this day or whatever else. With you, you've always practiced having that one day and that balance that that one day brings you because you know i was in a relationship i was young then over the years of course i get get with ali and one thing you always have practiced and preached about is balance in life making sure that yes bodybuilding is all encompassing is fucking groundhog day but that one day be it Saturday, be it Sunday, you made sure that I cut off bodybuilding. I don't want you to fucking talk about it. I don't want you to think about it. Yes, I still had to do my cardio. I still had to do whatever I did to do. But that day was kind of like our day. So I remember asking you many times, what can I have to eat, coach? I won't give a fuck whatever you want. And knowing damn well that I earned that cheat meal, you or, or it was coming up to you truly would bust your ass because it's a it's a very gratifying reward to have when you can truly cheat, choose your cheat meal. Because again, a lot of these athletes out there, even to this day right now, they don't have that ability. They eat them fucking nuts. You know, they're having like more sweet potato um, on this whatever random day their coach tells you to have. But with all your diets and all the people that you work with, is that something that, that you do with everybody or is that just with myself, having that one meal a week? No, I'd probably say a big percentage. You know, maybe 90, 95% of people oh. would always have a cheat meal at some point. And it wasn't just because of the fact it's self-reward. It's because it was necessary at the time as yes. well. And you were where you needed to be. And is one cheat meal in the week or two cheat meals in a week going to be detrimental of the end result? Maybe 24 hours out, 24 hours out from the show. Why is it that some of these people... <laughs> Don't get cheat meals throughout their diet. But the night before the show, yeah. or the morning of the show, the coach is giving them this shit. Yeah. Yeah, and then you don't know how it's going to respond. Shit like, loading. Y- shit loading, right? Yeah. So stupid. it's not that I'm saying that that won't work for somebody, but my point is pretty much the only negative with two negatives. Once you get a taste for that food, are you going to be able to control that temptation? That's one. The second thing is, is that you are potentially going to get some form of inflammatory response. Mm-hmm from eating foods that your body's not necessarily your digestive system isn't used to. But if you're overtraining, if you're over dieting, you're in a catabolic state, your gut health is compromised straight away because it's interlinked with your endocrine system, right? So it's the fact that if you are where you need to be at that present time with your physique, Mm. enjoy life, give it back to those people which are supporting you, which are loving you. Do they really want to go out and have a dinner with you eating a piece of cucumber <laughs> no who wants to like, be around that guy no, like, so <laughs> i know so, people like so there's a reason and, and i also feel that you know having a uh, a high day of calories can be very conducive with fat loss as well at times yeah. it can be a really good kickstart to get your physique moving again in the right direction yeah i wanted to ask a question though how did you get into coaching you know because you 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 were on stage obviously as an athlete that was when you were younger you met Flex at a certain point. You were still competing. But how did you get into, you know, realizing well, I want to coach? Well, I, I never actually thought at one point I was going to become a coach. And I never really said. What happened is that 
how many times over the years when you were 19, 20, 21, people were asking you questions about, hey, what are you doing, right? Mm. So that would happen because they looked at your physique and they admire your physique, right? Mm. So who are they going to ask questions to? You or your coach. They're not going to ask those questions to somebody which has no relatability. So because I did well, obviously, as an athlete back in the UK, and more so is that, like, you know, Welsh is just, it, Wales is very small. So when people ask me questions, I was happy to help. Yeah. I was, I was happy to help. Um, but also my time was limited because I was working two full-time jobs. And then what happens then? You just build these innocent relationships. Like, we met, but you introduced me to other people. And at least six people within a circle started working with me. Yeah. Steve went on to work with me, right? And the best ship they ever uh, yeah, fucking just gone into. Absolutely. Just, he went to a whole new level. And I'm not saying it was because of Neil Hill. It was because the first time he was doing everything that he should be doing. Yeah. Like him in this first show. He was over dieting. He was under eating. He was over training. So the reason, one of the biggest, hardest things for him possibly, that when he started my diet was possibly harder was because he was eating more food. So yeah. psychologically, food. that goes against your mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the training was a different type of stimulus. So there were there were many layers of that. But when it came for me to, to be coaching, it just instantly happened. And it came to a point that I couldn't, I couldn't carry on doing my full-time yeah. job at the time and do that at the same time. I won my pro card in 2002. In 2003, three in about say june time i stepped away from competing because my knee was so bad i knew that i couldn't do in the do what i needed to do in the gym there was no 202 there was no 212 it was open yeah. bodybuilding I, and i believed that i would have made it in that industry if i didn't have this knee issue and it was how, a very how do, you, how do you get any issue for it the, was fetching it twice i no, want, I want it, you to tell the it's, fans it's just a hereditary you know issue when i was born my right knee was not torn enough the ligaments were too loose so what happened is my knee used to float so my knee would just randomly dislocate itself mm. and because of me being an athlete yes and because of my main stroke being breaststroke yeah, it's a kicking. completely unnatural movement yeah. right it's completely unnatural now yes swimming can be a great f uh, a great form of exercise when you go through rehab phases because it's not impacting with weight yeah but but when you have that genetic flaw and your joint is floating around every time you kick out you're getting slight bone to bone contact mm -hmm. so what happened is you know back then you know i struggled with my training to do what i i couldn't do what i wanted to do in the gym but i did what i needed to do yeah to, to bring the physique to the stage but when I turned pro, and then I had laparoscopic surgery, maybe like say five months later, and then you know they they told me the extent of my knee joint is about a quarter of my knee joint completely missing. He see my MRI scans. Fucking scouts. mess. Like you have my it's like a MRI. Black hole. Seriously, I've got like a quarter of my knee joint completely missing wow. yeah. on my. And then when you're you're walking around at like say maybe two hundred pound in the off season and you're fucking strong and you've got compression from weight, right? You're just talking about like it's like horrendous like toothache in your knee all the time. And it was just my quality of life was just being affected. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. And it was a tough decision for me to... Of course. And then I met Flex. He introduced me to other people. And then when I stepped away from being a competitive bodybuilder and I didn't train at all for six years, no. did not train for six years because I was heartbroken. Yeah. Because yeah. I wanted, because I, because... It's tough. I, yeah. Because I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I knew, yeah. you know, I, I knew I could do this. But you knew that the disability yeah. stopped you from doing it. Now, so the six, those six years you were coaching? I was coaching. You just weren't training in the gym? I was, wasn't training in Yourself. the gym. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't just wasn't training. Now, maybe I'd do a little bit of arms with him, but I wouldn't train again then for maybe six months. Yeah. So yeah. I wasn't. I, I wasn't. And, I had, and also at that time, even though I started off when I was an athlete or a bodybuilder, um, I started my year, my, I, I, st I did a five-year apprenticeship as a motor vehicle technician. All right, started when I was 16, finished that when I was 21. At 19 years of age, I also started working in a nightclub on the door. So I had all of those jobs going on the whole time, full time. And I didn't finish in the motor industry until 2003. Okay. And I did not stop working on the door until 2003 also. So um, 
so my point is I, ha- I was probably working 60, 70 hours every single week without fail, maybe more sometimes because yeah. I would be working in the summer months in Tembe. It's summertime, right? So what happened for maybe 14 to 16 weeks of the year, I'd start work in the garage at clock in at 8.30, finish at 5, get to the gym at like six, uh, 5.45, 6 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, when Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, get home from the gym maybe half seven, quarter to eight, shower, make food to the boys, the family, eat in the door, on the door then from nine o'clock in the morning, sorry, from nine, nine o'clock at night until two o'clock in the morning, get to bed at three o'clock, three hours sleep, because I had to get up at 6 a.m. to insane. do my cardio. Yeah. And, it, and I did that for 16 years. That's a lot. So when no I, idea. so when I, and, and, and my point is this, like, why is it today that people think that they can't have a job? Yeah. Job is structure. Job yeah. is discipline. Job is accountability. If you think that you're, you're not going to reach your fitness goals by having a job, I don't understand it. Because yeah. even if you have a labor-intensive job, increase your calories. It's that simple. Now, I'm not saying that if you are doing a high-impact in job role as far as uh, labor intensive, it might hamper your recovery. I only train four days a week because I know that any more than that was too much. Yeah. Dorian Yates, four days a week. Now, I'm not saying just because I did it, you have to do it. But my point in all of this is that having a job, having structure creates a far better balanced life, which ultimately, right, is going to bring more success. And you know, yeah, you mentioned about balance to me. It's very, very, it's it's very, very important to me. Balance is important to me with core values, and it's the essence of I would say long term happiness as well. And you were able to do that whilst working two jobs. You cut times in the in the day, uncompromisable times, where you had times with the boys. Weekends were always a time with the boys, or you know whatever the kids were doing. You'd spend that time. And again, we we were on the road a lot. When we were young, and and that's something now I look back on being a dad myself, and I can truly thank you for even cutting a lot of that time out away from your boys to spend with me and and chase. Well, ultimately, even though it was our our goal, I was the one up there that was getting the the bigger praise, right? But even though throughout the years and everything we've done, you know, for me, looking back. I made sure that we were recognized as a team. You know, every sponsor that I've had, it was, okay, my contract's done. No, the plus one is him. Mm -hmm. I'm not signing from the Gaspari to the BSN to to the Yamamoto. Um, But obviously, you as a coach, Yamamoto's different, but you as a coach, Yamamoto came after you, you know. But when we were negotiating everything, I made sure that, this is this is a team. We're signing a team. This is break this up, and you know you're not going to get the best result. We are, um, we are, we are. It's, it's a better package for us to be signed as a team because we can put a lot of stuff on content for YouTube for for every type of socials. But um, but it all goes back to that day one of. I know you mentioned this earlier, and it's going to kind of kind of come out later on in the in the in the podcast. My first ever supplement contract was because of Neil. Mm. Neil had a contract, as you mentioned, you know, injury prevented you from uh, going and doing your your future on stage. And even though you were injured, Kerry Case um, said, no problem, we, we'll stay loyal to you. You know, you've been loyal to us. You've, you know, we, we love you as, as the athlete that you are, regardless of whatever you do, we keep the sponsorship as it is, and you were like, no, I want this young kid, Flex Lewis, to get my sponsorship. And it was, uh, that was like unbelievable to me because I had no money. And then I get this introduction to CMP, which at the time was the best company in the United Kingdom, the best, Mm -hmm. the main sponsor of all the shows. And we were able to, well, I was able to, through that that sponsorship, um, level up. And it was uh, an opportunity that, um, again, I'm, I'm truly grateful for. And, and uh, one of the reasons why it's installed in me that 
with a team, right? Because you didn't have to do that. You could have said, hey, kid, you know, save up your money and, you know, do your thing. Um, but you were like, no, I want this guy to have it because he will benefit a lot more than I do. And, I, and again, that, that is something that I'll uh, never forget and I'm truly grateful to it to this day. And that's one of the reasons why we've, we've done things together because it's, you know, it, it's, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of the people that are in this industry right now, it's a singular, right? Mm-hmm. It's you, you see, look how many fucking people chop shop, jump mm-hmm. coaches. You know, there's an opportunist shiny fucking something over here, and this this relationship that has been forged for X amount of years. It's like, oh, but this is, sorry, boy, you understand, yeah. right? You mm-hmm. you understand. It's like, no, fuck that. We've never we've never separated ourselves from money. We've never separated ourselves from this opportunity. There, you know, obviously we've got big lofty goals and dreams, but. There's a moral compass to our relationship, right? We've never kind of uh, chased the shiny fucking coin, and that's one of the reasons why we've we've got longevity, not only as a as a relationship between us, but with every other relationship outside of the sport, you know, uh, which in this industry is very rare. But going back to, you know, your your um, the coaching category, I know that it must have been an incredible and tough time to be the top of the tree when in your pro card going on to do the British Grand Prix and standing against the best the best Ronnie Coleman was in that mix I remember watching that Grand Prix and there there is Neil Hill with his fucking blur coming out <laughs> shredded which I'll get that footage for all the viewers watching this and then obviously having to say okay man I, I, I can't do this um, but thankfully coaching came about and Take us through that time of you building up your coaching to 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 where we are now. I know that obviously there's there's people you've mentioned already that you got involved with, but truly, when did you see yourself being like, "Fuck, I'm actually really good at this." You know, everybody can be a coach, but there's a skill, there's an eye, there's there's a it factor to being a coach that separates you, honey. You know, the guys like Chris Asiro, there's levels to this. And obviously you are in that mix. Guy from Wales, Tembe, small town, coming out to the United States and having athletes, winning pro shows, winning Olympias. When did you know prior to all that that you had that ability? Um, I think when... I had three back to back back overall British title wins and probably more so with Zach Khan because Zach was this big name and this monstrous person yeah. who had a really great physique was, which was never in show shape and everybody he worked with so many different coaches in the UK and and he was that athlete where if he brought it he was going to absolutely smash. It was not even going to be close. Yeah. But he never brought it before. And it was the first year of us working together and the only year that we worked together. And, you know, when he brought what he brought to the stage, like nobody was expecting. Yeah. And, of course, I had this image in my head, what I wanted to bring to the stage with him. And it was an only, it was only a, an image that I knew that he could achieve. And I think it was then that I felt like, maybe I could just do this full time. Yeah. You understand? Was um, that a relief, though? Because you were working all these jobs. Um, no, because I tell you why. is because when I was working all those other jobs, I was earning more money. Yeah. And it was stability, because, right? Because, was yeah. because I wasn't charging. 99% of people I wasn't charging. It was just my passion. Really? Right. You weren't charging yeah. back well, then? Well, just very little. I mean, flex. Like, yeah. Okay, so how much time did I... I put a lot of time into you, right? Yeah, but yeah. how much did I put into Pricey and all those guys? Yeah, a lot of the Like, points. seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was probably... I was putting the same amount of time and attention into those those six guys that I was given to him. Mm. And I also had another job and I was probably charging him two hundred dollars total for a twelve week, fourteen week prep. Jesus. And so I all you guys I, fucking lost the board you know, back so in the day. You should have got on that two hundred dollar so, deal. <laughs> so and, and we're talking about today's money. We're not talking yeah, about yeah. back then, right? Mm. And I can remember saying to you, Flex, I can't keep doing this. And he goes, Hey, listen. It's, it's going to work out. Like, listen, because I was one point I was going to say, I can't do this anymore. I have responsibilities, right? And, yeah. I, and I can't be working and, and doing all this for... Because I, I felt that I didn't value my time as well. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't realize that maybe I can charge people for my time. 
Yeah. You understand? Yeah. You know, like I will say, like, how can I say this without sounding? Just fucking neg- say it. No, because it because it can be taken out. Anything can be taken out of context, right? Yeah. Some people. Yeah, are we love that. We we'll edit it if it sounds bad, but we'll know, keep it in if it sounds good. Some Let's people go. will be offended by the word "cunt." It's part of my favorite <laughs> word, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking at you in the but, back. But, but, but my point is this: like, don't take it out of fucking context. Yeah, you know, take it for what it's meant, right? Yeah. I feel like I've given too much time away over the fucking years. No question, and it's not being fucking appreciated. Yeah, do you understand? It hasn't been appreciated. I've given you so many of yeah. my boys' birthdays with you. Yeah. Time away from my my ex-wife's birthday. Time away from me. I gave all of this time for everybody else, and I didn't. You don't need to give it back to me with money, but just appreciate what I've given you. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. And it's not about a money thing because we can always spend more money. We can always we can always save more money. We can always waste more money. But but it but, you, but health, happiness, and time you will never get back. And one of the things that ups, has upset me over the years is not having time with you. Mm. You understand? Time away from the fucking industry, but well, sit yeah. down and let's talk. Yeah. Let's enjoy this meal. Let's enjoy breakfast. Yeah. And it's just like, I don't want to hear how about how busy you are. I'm fucking busy too. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? Like, and I think, you know, that's my biggest frustration. Not even frustration. I think I've given all this time. And sometimes you know that you know you put you put time into relationships and businesses and and you just you don't have to you just want to be appreciated yeah. and success to me I don't have to win accolades and I've been very fortunate to be you know awarded some amazing things right coach of the and, year um, as one you know like just but um, for me you know as a coach it's just like it's an innocent sense of uh, passion that drives me and, uh, and it's never going to because if I change my want and my desire to be a great coach I'm going to lose my passion mm. and if I lose my passion I lose the want to do what I do because I still love my work you I do. love 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 what I do I, yeah. I am no lesser um, less motivated or inspired to progress with my coaching now than I was when I met you but it was innocent back then right yeah. So you said Jack Khan was that moment. Yeah. Um, and Jack Khan looked fucking nuts at you. Can, can you tell us the story and the viewers about uh, what you had to do with Zach to, to get in? Oh, there's get in. There's, you, you, there's you can leave, you can leave some, of the, some stories out, but t- tell him what you'd done when he was living with you. What you'd, what you'd done just to make sure that well, he, he delivered. You won't find this funny because you're not there in a the moment, right? But you've got this guy who's weighing over 300 pounds, and he was a freak. He was an absolute freak of muscle, right? And he didn't have any weaknesses in his physique. Maybe his upper chest needed to come up a little bit. And I felt the pressure because, like, I didn't know if I wanted this extra pressure, but I also had this, like, desire and want to do something that nobody's ever done before, right? Yeah. Yeah? That's, uh, and it's not, a se- it's not a sense of, like, arrogance. Y- you want to do something which has never been done before. Has ever been a, a, a seven-time Mr. Olympia before? No. Is there ever going to be? We don't know. We really don't know. And if there is going to be another seven-time Mr. Olympia, it's going to take seven years from this year. And the reason I say that is because Kamal's got to win. Derek's got to win. Um, Sean's got to win. Derek's Derek's going into the open class. Kamal obviously lost that title, yes, uh, two years ago. So my point is seven Back to back Olympia wins. Yeah. So you may be an eight. There may be an eight-time Mr. Olympia, but how many years is it going to take to be a seven-time back to back Mr. Olympia? Another seven years from now. Yeah, because yeah. Sean right? has to regain his okay. title too, right? So you know, Matt, one of my closest coaches in the industry, Matt Jensen, mm. just huge ap- aspiration and like look and admire him so much in different ways. But him being a coach, they're fixated on something, right? When we won that first title, it was then we concentrate on the next and the next and the next. Of course, we talked and we talked about layers, all right, about how many, when are we going to step away, when are we going to do this, for instance. Um, But I felt a lot of pressure with Zach because he was the one person that everybody 
had been talking about for 10 years, no eight question. years, and everyone wanted to see him in shape and everyone would give up on him. And I felt the pressure. Yeah. And I don't know, I thought, I don't know if I really want this pressure because then if you don't deliver, mm. you start, you potentially could doubt yourself, yeah. but you can't control what those fuckers are doing behind closed doors. Are they doing their cardio? Are they eating those meals? Are they doing what they need to do, right? Yeah. So I had him come down and live with, live with me for many, many weeks. And I can remember us doing cardio together. And I'm walking, doing cardio, like we have done many, many, many times together, all right? Doing and it together. Together, yeah. right? Together. And this guy is literally 100 meters behind me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what are you doing? You're like six foot tall. You got legs twice as long as me. Yeah. You should be out striding me. And it just told me he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing for the weeks and weeks before. So basically, I had to make sure that there's nothing in his fridge he could, he could eat. He could not go anywhere without <laughs> me being there. So it was basically, it was a, it was a prison, I suppose. <laughs> you know, you leave, we do cardio together. You eat, you sleep, you train, you go back. Because that is what I needed or required in order to feel that we would bring the deliverables. It wasn't about control because I was controlling. His efforts are controlling the, out, uh, the, the result. Yeah. Mm. And it's going to impact how I feel about the result. Yeah. I had no issues if he came second, third or fourth, knowing that we did everything that we needed to do, right? right. But it was important that I had that confidence that he was doing everything that he was supposed to. And back then as well... Even though I didn't train for six years after I finished bodybuilding, I started training again, right? So I trained with all you guys, yes? You did. And I definitely, definitely set the precedence as, as far as intensity. I wasn't going to be as strong as I used to as an athlete because I was 30, 40 pounds less muscle, right? Yeah. But my point is, is that I would never be worked outworked in the gym as far as the, as far as the emotional, physical element as, as far as intensity is concerned. Yeah. And that's what I exec expected from my athletes. So for him, it was, I think it was just a, a big wake up call for Zach. Um, but he. Didn't you put a bell on the fridge? Uh, I didn't put a bell on the fridge, mate. <laughs> but I no, I didn't put a bell on the fridge. But what I did do is make sure there was nothing in that fridge that he couldn't eat. Oh, right? I, I, heard, I heard a rumor that yeah. came from Zach. It was probably Zach which that said came it. came to yeah, me. Yeah. But you yeah, put yeah. a bell on the fridge uh, and the fucking bell went off and you jumped out of bed. This is something <laughs> I was relating yeah, yeah, to. Okay. And uh, I guess Neil was fucking there like the the, the the ghost of Christmas past <laughs> fucking standing right in front of him. What are you doing? <laughs> is that true? Is it a, is it, is it a, no. a truth to that story? No, there isn't truth oh, other right. than the fact that I, you know, we were in the sop supermarket shopping. Mm -hmm. He could not leave anywhere without, you know, unless we were together. <laughs> yeah. Because I was not willing to jeopardize the result on stage. Yeah. And I yeah. think that has got to be one of my favorite, I wouldn't say achievements, but one of my favorite moments because it was like, we fucking did the impossible. We Everybody did, we did, we off. did what nobody else said was possible. Yeah. And it wasn't the fact that he had won Ali. His look was absolutely off the chart. Incredible. That rear double bicep pose, right? I mean, the guy was probably weighing 265 pounds, 270 pounds on stage. Peeled. Peeled, man. And just, we brought everything that we should have. A number of months later, he did something silly and reckless in the gym, showing off with some younger guys and basically both detached knees, both his right? knees. And that was, no is it? Oh, yeah, his, I remember his, that. His whole career over. It was just like, and the guy had a future. And it was this. really upsetting. I can remember you and I were talking on the phone. Me and him talking on the phone. He's in America. Yes. I can remember talking on the phone. The next minute, Zach's calling. Delete the call. Me and him talking. Zach calls. Delete the call. Me and him talking. Delete the call. I said, mate, let me come off the phone a minute. Zach's trying to call me. Hey, mate, you good? Hey, coach. What's the matter? I just blowed my knees. What? <sighs> what were you doing? I was doing hack squat. Why are you doing hack squat? It wasn't in your plan. Because he had a small partial hamstring tear a number of weeks before. So I wrote his training program. And he was like, he was doing hack squats with like six, seven, eight pl plates aside with these young kids. He was strong as fuck, and see, it, wasn't he? And it was just like, what are you doing? It was just, and that was just a story in itself. And that was sad mm. because I liked the person, right? And when you like the person and you want the best for that person, you're emotionally invested in their happiness. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, you're and you're really doing the things that you're happy like. You know, like 
it's it's not it, it it's just like you want the very best for them how many times have we had conversations about life mm. not just bodybuilding no. how many times have i said hey listen that's not the right thing to do if you want long term happiness and health and all these things it's not just about bodybuilding it's more than that so when you have that emotional attachment to people it's not about just being a bodybuilder on stage it's about everything because how many of these amazing Mr. Olympia bodybuilders don't look like bodybuilders anymore, mm. right? Because it's the past, right? Yeah. So you have to think about everything. You just can't think about today. You've got to think about long-term and future and happiness and health because sometimes people chase just one thing. They neglect all the other elements, but we all get older, right? Mm. And it's not about living with regret, but it is about trying to make sure that you find the balance of everything which is going to give you the greatest results and for Zach I think he was that probably he was that he was that client to me which made me feel like hey I could be good at this yeah but it was you that gave me that opportunity because even though Zach overnight got global recognition picked up a sponsorships became a weeder athlete all these things happened literally within 24 hours right um it was Flex's success which brought my success, but I also know it wasn't forced. It was, it was innocent, right? It's organic. Yeah. Yeah. I think also that I was working with somebody that wasn't a big name at the time, mm -hmm. so there was like this mystique yeah. that that was created, and of course, your nickname Yoda, which is no. Become. And you know I don't like that name. Um, I hated it, I but now I just it. accept it and I go with it. And it's like, okay, I can. It's part of this. you. Yeah, I, I was calling later. him. I was calling him Yoda for fucking for a minute, and then he was like, I don't like this. So of course, <laughs> okay, Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the the name obviously is has become part of the brand Y three T brand, and uh, it's very synonymous to this. And everybody who knows you knows the training style and um, and what you've created over the years. Um, I want to talk about Y3T shortly, but before that, you were, you were mentioning, uh, I mentioned about, you know, us working together and, and the coach that was continually being mentioned from Wales. I think the fact that you were from Wales, from a small town, you weren't obtainable. This fucker hated the internet at the time. I was trying to get him on message boards, email and that's how we had our correspondence for the first couple of years in the united states because mm -hmm. you know back then i would hear oh you know i hate this fucking shit <laughs> i don't know how to work this so i was like gotta fucking learn man this is the future but obviously we didn't know what it was going to become to mm -hmm. but but that's yeah. our, our conversation and you gotta remember too he is very old school so all the viewers watching this what i mean by that is he only would prep people in their physical being he wouldn't do photos you wouldn't do, you know, whatever the fucking everybody works on right now. Because I would say 19, probably 95% of people right now in this fucking sports industry, in the fitness world, work with online clients. That's the thing. Yeah. So that means what? Photos being sent once a week to their coaches. Coaches look at it, analyze, they change the plan, they send it back. That's what you've had to adapt to now. Mm -hmm. It's the evolution of the sport. But back then... He was turning down a lot of clients that that couldn't physically um, that, be there. that couldn't well that were sending him emails. First of all, it would probably take him a fucking month to open up the email because <laughs> he would no clear what was going on at the time. Um, and then, um, obviously, the evolution of our relationship forced you into really learning technology and getting to getting your head around it. And I was like, listen. You know, we came to that crossroads. I'll open that kind of worms too. We came to that crossroads too where he said, man, this is fucking hard. I, I, I don't know if, you know, I'd be able to get through this technology. I was like, man, this is, for us to work at that point in time, this is how we're going to have to to communicate, you know? And, um, of course, and that's one of the many reasons I'm proud of him is that you invested a lot of time into learning about, you know, something that uh, that you had no clue about. I don't know how you you went about learning, but you fucking done it. Then we started that, you know, the emails. The, obviously, we had the calls going, and then you started kind of coming in periodically with certain 
industry stuff, right? So then the right does start finding out about Neil, and of course, he now would have fucking used an email at this point in time, so he'd email back people, <laughs> and they would ask him all the questions, then they got on the phone, so, and then the, he started spending, Neil started spending a lot of time with me in prep. So not only would he, going back to the whole, you know, devoting time to me, you would come out six weeks sometimes, a month mm. before the show to spend time with me, live with me, and I'm not the fucking easiest person to live with, I know, nor are you. But uh, we had that, that relationship, and again, having FaceTime with him, then I could introduce Neil to certain people that I had met. So it was, uh, at the time, everything was organic, but we really didn't know. <laughs> there was no game plan. You know, there's an M or to most fucking people that try to come into my life right now. You know, there's a motive. But we were just like, oh, that's that's so and so, you know. And it was like, oh, we gotta get a knowing because we'll play us better. There was none of that. Mm -hmm. There was this is the head judge of this show. One of the first shows that where we competed in was the Tampa Pro, Tim Gardner, and you guys had a pre existing relationship prior to doing that show, right? Did you always no, have the first time? No, no, no. Okay. The first time I ever met Tim and and um, um, the people which impacted me, you know, as an early coach was Tim Gardner and also um, Steve Weinberger. And the reason I say that is because it was the first pro show that I attended in the USA. You introduced me to these people mm. and they genuinely genuinely embrace me right yeah. and i was also nervous because i kind of thought like what are all these people gonna think because i'm from the uk are they gonna like think like hey you shouldn't be here like you know like i felt i don't get intimidated by people i don't have that personality so i'm kind of alpha male right but my point is is that everybody wants to be accepted so yeah. i didn't know how mm. how i would be embraced but Steve, who I knew nothing about other than being a, 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 a sense of leadership, and obviously Tim being a promoter, they were incredible influences were. on me. Yeah, they really yeah. were. And, and it, it was innocent, you understand? So for me, it was like being at obviously that show, being introduced to those people, and then stepping away from that with, with just great experiences from what you brought to the show and obviously your result but also how i was greeted and met by those gentlemen as well and to this day um i'd say that i can sense the the real people and friends mm -hmm. you understand yeah steve obviously uh, is uh one of the you know in my eyes top five guys i mm -hmm. i i have in my life in terms of being able to just pick up a phone and be like, hey, you know, black and white. Mm -hmm. or, and, and separation between friendship and judging too, you know. And obviously over the years that relationship has, has, has fl fl flourished. Flourished. <laughs> but um, at that, you know, going back to Tampa Pro, the first pro show, we came second. In David Henry was incredible. He was coming from the open class down into the newly created 202 class. And um, I remember the, the open arms that they give not only you, but for me also. And and uh, it was a great feeling, you know. We were, uh, I don't know how to, how to put it, but we were not from the U.S. So we had no pre-experience with the MPC, because a lot of the judges that judge the, the pro shows were MPC judges. So they had somewhat of a judging relationship. Mm -hmm. We came in here as like, oh, look at these kids from the other side of the world. But again, we were looked after. And it was great to see your relationship turn into what it is now and, Obviously, now over the years, you're probably one of the most sought-after coaches. Um, you know, you've won so many awards from our first show to, to where you are now. And now you've got a wide rostrum of a roster. Rostrum? <laughs> wide roster of athletes. All the way from guys and girls who are trying to get in shape, CEOs of companies, Mr. Olympian athletes, Miss Olympia to superstar celebrities such as Roman Reigns. You sit back sometimes and think, holy shit, this is incredible. Like, do you have them, do you have them moments? I don't because, I, I don't because it's still my passion, right? Mm -hmm. So my point is, is that it does feel a little bit surreal. So when I was in, um, you know, last year when I was with Roman, or was it this year? 
Yeah, this year, this actually, year. this year. In Dallas, yeah. right? In Dallas, yeah, in Dallas, you know, for um, that huge, obviously, not synonymous WWE event. Is it SummerSlam or WrestleMania? WrestleMania. I don't think I've ever been anywhere where I've kind of just got taken back as far as an audience is concerned. Because, you know, I fly in, you know, I'm with Joe for like a week before the event, etc. Roman Reigns, Joe. Yeah, Roman Reigns. We fly to, um, fly into Dallas and um, I fly into Dallas and I remember, I think you said, or somebody said, hey, fucking put a picture up, man, of, yeah. uh, you know, the private jet. And I think, I don't really want to do that because... I don't have to do that, right, Yeah. to feel good. But I also understand there are a lot of people which don't have those things in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really want to flaunt it. And I don't want to come across arrogant. But believe you me, I'm excited and I feel very proud of that moment, for instance, right? So I'm with Joe. We're backstage all of the time, all of the time. And the only time I go into that auditorium or that arena is when he performs. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I've I wish never, a GoPro I, on him. I have never seen so many people in one place in my and I and people were fanatical, right? Yeah. I was not ex because you go to the Olympia and when the Olympia is the Olympia and you've got that energy, yeah. you look around and you may have fifteen, twenty thousand people, but you're probably looking at a hundred thousand people in the stadium where people going crazy, right? Yeah. And it's a production of entertainment. The entertainment of the Olympia is you guys. Yeah, on stage. But it's all the other, and I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that, <laughs> right? So that was a moment where I was like, how have I got here? Like, how did this happen? But it was your introduction as well. It was like Flex would say to me from time to time, hey, you've got to come to the gym. We've got some really big VIPs coming in. And I'd be like, mate, I don't want the time. Come on, you've got to meet these people. I said, I've got so much work I've got to do. Like, because you yeah. know what's going to happen. We're all, we all have that innocence where we think okay it's only going to last an hour no it doesn't last an hour it lasts two three four hours because yeah. you become you get into conversation sometimes it's rude to step away and sometimes you're just so intrigued by the competition uh, by the conversation yeah. you want it to carry on mm. so what happened is that um, you know i go into the gym and i'm quite reserved i think some people think i'm miserable and serious and things like this i, I remember one person saying to me you don't look very happy <laughs> I said, no, I'm actually a happy guy. I said, but I've been babysitting this fucker for the last 12 weeks. I wanted to win the show. I go and get to bed and get to sleep. I said, yeah. then I'm going to be happy. But I'm quite reserved. So when I, if I don't know somebody, I'm not, I'm not arrogant and I'm not rude. I'm very, very approachable. But I don't tend to go up and start conversation because no. I don't have that sense of uh, confidence. And also... I don't want to come across as if I'm just like trying to put yourself put myself forward yeah. because I'm there innocently, yeah, not yeah. because there is an, an you know MO. an MO, right? So yeah. I can remember, you know, being there and I went up to you know to Roman and I said, Hey, you know, just wanna say, you know, like say much respect for what you do and you know, like yeah. you know, do great work. And he said, What's your name? And I said, Neil, he goes, I need to speak to you after. This is in Boca Gym, right? Yes, yeah, in Boca Gym. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, what's your name? I said, Neil. He said, I need to speak to you after. <laughs> he said, I, I want to work. I said, what? He said, I want to work with you. He said, I, I need to speak to you. And I said, mate, what, what's that? He said, yeah, he knows you are. You know, I've spoken to him, this, this, and this. And that was it. Then we spoke. We sat down. We spoke. We exchanged message, uh, numbers. I didn't think that he was going to contact me. Two, three, four hours later, he messaged me. We met up the following day, and then it went from there. Yeah. And um, I didn't realize what a superstar was. I told yeah. him until yeah, no clue. until I went into that arena. Do you yeah. understand? Like experience it for yourself. It's for myself. Yeah. And because I've had that personal time in his home, around his family, the guy is so normal, right? Mm. And with me, I've always been one of those people who I've never been a fanboy because I also understand that humans are humans, right? But anybody can portray themselves as a as a person or as a character right. when they need to but the real person is who they are behind closed doors and some people aren't like what you and it's a disappointment yeah and for me joe was everything that i hoped he was and more probably too and more because the guy is a father a loving kind affectionate real father a 100 percent committed husband to his wife who loves his family dearly and he's just a normal guy and he's mm. an athlete because 
I've trained with this guy multiple times. You train with this guy. This guy does not get outworked. No. He yeah. is an athlete. You know, he's an athlete who has to be a three-dimensional individual when he steps on, obviously, into that arena. And I think he's probably been one of those people who's like, wow. And there's been times, obviously, when you stepped on stage and you've won an Olympia, or it might be a th three-time Olympia, or whatever it is. Mm. It's sometimes the moments that, like that, you kind of realize, like, hey, like, I wouldn't say that you feel like I've made it, but you kind of just pinch yourself and think, how did this all happen? Mm. And then you analyze and think, because you're fucking passionate about what you do. Yeah. And when you're passionate about what you do and you give people your passion and they give that passion back in their way, then it's noticeable. It's rewarding. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it is rewarding. Yeah, with you and, and uh, Roman Reigns, Joe, you truly, because you don't follow the sport of wrestling, you know old school guys, but you knew of the name, but you didn't know how big he was. And I kind of told you a few times how big this guy was. And uh, I know it sunk in, but I, I remember you messaging me some voice notes um, from WrestleMania, and you were like, no flex. You don't understand. You don't understand <laughs> how this this place is fucking nuts, man. You, you don't understand. I was like, no, I understand. I, I'm telling you, you. I knew it would rock your world, but the whole experience to you, the Jets, you know, the, again, I know you've got many stories that you've had with, with Joe and the experiences. Is, 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 is a, you know, looking back to this, to how this started, uh -huh. I, I truly hope as, you know, your friend, somebody that... Um, you know, that you've coached. And now, as I've matured through years, I've had to tell myself, smell the roses. Stop, just try to take this in. Because there were many years, you know, on the Olympia stage that I didn't, I didn't. It was on to the next. And that's probably because of how you and I have brain trained ourselves. Mm -hmm. You would tell me. It's like, hey, you know, fucking chill out a little bit. But uh, it was only probably till the last show. You know, I've said this a few times on the podcast that I, Truly said, okay, this is it. This is the last 212. You know, we, we, we're going to do the open after this, but this is the last 212. Enjoy the moment from the fan interaction all the way to when I walked off that stage and I remember walking off and giving that last look. Because remember at the end, you have to take the photos and you stand in the, in the circle and you do your favorite couple of shots. Photographers take the photos. I just remember picking up my trophy, walking off, looking back and being like, that's it. This is this is the last version of this guy. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize it was going to be the last version ever. Um, but I think a lot of people listening to this need to take heed and just be in the moment. And, you know, even when we had Max in, I was there. I remember sitting outside the room before going in. The doctor, nurse, and doctors calling me in, and I was like, "Man, like, all right, mm -hmm. just you're you, you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Just just fucking be you." Yeah. Be in the moment, and you know, probably you see me. I was fucking balling, you know, mm -hmm. I was getting all kind of fucking teary, which is very hard, you know. Um, but is uh, just listening to that voice note you sent me, I was like, wow, I'm so happy you're you're you're, you're going through this because it's been tough times, you know. You've the, even for me, if we, we've questioned the process, injuries with you, you've had you know, all these other things that are coming along, but this is like the fucking pinnacle. You know, at this point in time, you you look at the the guys who are at the top of the tree and Roman Reigns is in it. He's mm -hmm. a superstar. He is the face of WWE and this is the guy that, that you're, you're, you're prepping and helping and, and what a great phys physique he had at that WrestleMania. But um, with that chapter said, I want to touch on, on Y3T and, and, and where... Where this started and, and how it came about, because this training style of yours is very unique. It's something that's not even on the market until you kind of started promoting it. But was this something that you've always done? But tell the viewers about the story of how this trainer system, Y3T, is now used globally. Well, actually, Flex came up with the name of Y3T, right? Um, because of my knee issues... And because I was very hyper-responsive. So when prep started and I s flicked that switch, for me it would normally be about 14 weeks out from the show. Um, 
I wouldn't say that I was lazy in the off-season, but I probably spent nearly as much time out of the gym in the off-season as I did in the gym because I wanted to be a dad and I wanted to be fat and I didn't want to be consumed by it. And I was very, very, very fortunate that I was super responsive of building muscle once I step into that environment, eat, sleep, train, etc. And I didn't want that lifestyle all the time. When I first started training at 19, probably up to the age of maybe 22, 23, or whatever it may be, I wanted to be a professional bodybuilder. And then what happened, I went to watch some shows. I'd see athletes who I think, oh, that guy's going to be 10th, and he's at the top 15. And I'm like, how did he not get in the top 10? And these are people I don't even know. Mm. And then I thought, I don't know if I want to be a professional bodybuilder because if I put all that effort and energy into it, and I don't place as where I want to. It's not about being a bad sport. It's the fact that can I make all these sacrifices Again. to do that? Yeah. You understand? Because I, I have to be able to live life as well, right? And um, I kind of changed my attitude towards training. I became a lifestyle trainer. So if I wanted to train, I'd train. If I didn't want to train, I wouldn't go to the gym. So I spent mm. a lot of time at the gym. But when I was in that gym, I would respond. And my strength would shoot up really quick. So what, so what would happen is that um, I would pick up tendonitis, bicep, tricep, and I ended up te tearing my patella back in when I was about 22, 23, 24 years of age. Maybe 24. Anyway, I, 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 I tore my patella on my left leg early, and I didn't train legs for about 18 months. And my legs were my genetic weakness in the, min in the sense that they were never big legs. So I had to really put that effort into the gym. And when I put the effort in, they would respond really well. Whereas if I didn't train my back or my arms, it would be okay because they would still they would still have volume. Yeah. My legs were the opposite to his legs, for instance, right? So when I came to realize that I could not train Doran Yake's Mike Menster style training. Hit training. Okay, hit style training. I had to change my training approach. And what happened is during a period of time, what I would do, I would get frustrated because I haven't trained for weeks and weeks and weeks. Step into the gym, go to train arms. Like, freaking can't fucking train, man. Mm -hmm. I thought, just lift really lightweight and just do more repetitions. And what I found is I thought that possibly what would happen is that I would still lose muscle, but not at the rate that I did before. Mm -hmm. I thought it might create enough stimulus to maintain something as opposed to see a big, you know, sense of atrophy, atrophy taking place. Yeah. And what I found is that my muscle group started to respond. They started to grow. And what I would do, stupidly, when you got rid of that tendonitis, what would you do? you go and lift heavy yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. So it probably took you two or three years to, to, to say, stop doing this shit. It doesn't, it doesn't work for you. Mm. Right. You don't have the biomechanics. You don't have the, you don't have the ability to train like that. So I just started innocently changing my training stimulus where I was doing say low repetitions for maybe one or two weeks, high repetitions for one or two weeks. And I would cycle my training like that. I think the first training session we probably had back when you were 19 was a probably a, a 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 rep leg day, right? As far as leg press. Okay, yeah. okay so it's high reps. It's gonna concentrate on uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. I didn't know that there were different type of hypertrophic responses. I didn't know there was different muscle fibers in the human body. I just knew that if I trained this way, I was able to build muscle tissue. And I noticed that I saw a decrease in injuries dramatically. And I was able to progress at a faster rate than what I did before. Yeah. Now I do understand that we're all very different. So some people are not gonna respond in the same way. And then obviously when you start to learn more about the activation or load bearing weight and muscle fiber activation and, and, and rep ranges, you understand that there is science which backs up certain training philosophy. So for me, it was a three-dimensional training approach. Flex came up with the name of Y3 Team. He came up with the idea of bringing it to the marketplace because to me, it was my training style that I did. Yeah. But I never did it for anyone else. I did it for me and I did it for my athletes. Yeah. And that's how it was developed. And the only reason why okay. I've done it is because I said, I'm fed up with fucking answering everything like I, Neil Hill's training and, system. And I, and I remember where we were. We were in Dallas, Dallas Texas. Texas. He goes, listen, mate, you, we've got to fucking bring your trainer here, he said, because people are asking us this, 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 this. I don't know, man. He said, like, yeah, we've got to think of a name for it as well. I was like, <laughs> I don't know. He said, 
let's have a think about it. Like, you know, and then, <laughs> and then he, he but, so that's how it happened. But again, it happened innocently. It didn't, you know, there was never like, bring this to the marketplace because you can make money. No. Yeah. Because how much shit do we see on the marketplace, right? I would say probably 70 to 8% of the sports supplementation out there is shit, guys and girls. Yeah. You're buying a product based on Marketing. marketing. You're yeah. not buying a product based on quality. Yeah. yeah. And I'm really passionate about that. And it frustrates me. I'm not saying that all companies are like out there. I'm not saying that there aren't comp companies which are using great raw ingredients, but very few because what they're trying to do is they're trying to maximize profit margin, right? Yeah. That I, shit fucking supplement company, no one mentioned fucking marketing company, that was. You know, so you understand my point. So I'm not saying that supplementation can have benefits because they can, mm -hmm. but I'm immensely, immensely proud now to, ha to be in a position of not necessarily a sense of authority, but a position where you can be a part of something that you genuinely, genuinely believe in. Yeah. You can really stand behind a product and feel really proud of yourself, right? And then when you are somebody like yourself who's excelled and, and, and achieved the greatest, you don't want to be associated with anything else. Right. You, so, you just don't, right? Yeah, so, so, the, so the, um, the training style that you had has come through injury prevention. And I remember the multiple seminars that you've done around the world that I've been privy to and the, the, the multiple incredible cohorts and guests and things you've been invited to, you know, people who have gone to Harvard, business school, etc. You've done like, incredible seminars all around the world. When you tell them your training style, they're like, fuck, this is very interesting because there's three components to it. There's a week one, there's a week two, there's a week three, and each week is different. Can you, in short, kind of break down each week and, and tell people... Um, so about it and how it, it affects okay so body. to make it very simple okay because you don't need to go into anything other than just simple terms when we train and we apply stress and load on our bodies we create stimulus in some ways right so whether we're looking at an eccentric whether we're looking at total rep range whether we're looking at the weight that we're using you are going to target primarily primarily okay a certain type of hypertrophic response. So whether it's arcoplasmic, whether it's myofibia, whether you're looking at, and just say, whether you're looking at, say, slow twitch muscle fibers, medium twitch muscle fibers, or fast twitch muscle fibers. Fast twitch muscle fibers are going to be generated large motor unit recruitment from a lower rep range. So Dorian Yates hit style training, okay? Hyper, hyper responsive for breaking down muscle tissue. Then we go to the high spectrum to Fat, slow twitch muscle fibers, which are going to be responsible for activation through higher rep ranges. Okay, that rep range is not exactly scientifically proven as X, Y, and Z because we're different, and there are vulnerable uh, variables which have to be considered. So, why do I list a rep range if it's not exactly perfect? Because we're all different, yeah. right? But if you don't have a structure to follow or a program to follow, then you cannot just randomly change your diet every day, right? Mm. You need something to be structured. So week three workouts would be based on higher rep ranges. It could be based on drop sets. It could be based on supersets. It could be based on high work in repetition. So for instance, leg press, it's not a normal for me to put leg press workouts together in a week three workout where the rep range is 60 to 80 like or crazy. 80 to 100, or maybe it is only 20 to 30, but you are going to be targeting sarco uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, right? I also feel that when you bring a exercise to failure, failure to me means that you're not bringing secondary muscle groups into play you in bad form because I'm not an advocator of that. I'm not saying on certain exercises your form might start to slip a little bit just to get those extra repetitions. I don't have an issue with that. But we've all seen people being very guilty of very bad form. Yeah. All right. And maybe it works for them. But how do you know if it doesn't? If it, how do you know that training maybe the smart way would not be more responsive? Yeah. Because some people don't want change, right? So with Y3T, it's structured over multiple weeks to target different muscle fiber activation. 
when you bring a working set to failure, you're not just going to target sarcoplasmic hypertrophy because maybe that's its primary. Because I feel as a state of survival, your body will always try to adapt to bring extra muscle stimulus in. But the microcycle training is based on targeting, for instance, week one, fast twitch muscle fibers, week two, say medium much, uh, medium rep uh, twitch. twitch muscle fibers, and then week three, high rep training, which is going to be slow twitch muscle fibers. So my system is set up with week one, anywhere between six and 12 repetitions, primarily always based around compound movements, which are going to be based on large motor unit recruitment. So if it was going to be uh, shoulder day, it's going to be, say, shoulder press, lateral raise. Legs would be, like, say, uh, leg press, uh, squats. I'm not saying you're going to do both of those movements, like, say, squats and leg press, all mm. in the same workout. It depends on the muscle group and the way that, obviously, I write the program. For some people, like Flex, we might do three week one workouts and then one week two workout and then a week three workout. Or it could be the fact that our focus tends to be more based on higher reps on the leg day because his body responds more because genetically yeah. his muscle fiber DNA is broken down in a certain way. And it's not possible to know exactly what somebody's muscle fiber type is because you would have to go in, yeah. all right, yeah. microscopically. And, envi and, and, and environments and, and variables have to take in place. So it would be too intrusive. But with the science and the data which is out there, Y3T has a lot of scientific backup to show that the understanding of microcycling or high repetition training can be hyper beneficial for muscle growth development and also um, injury prevention. Years and years ago, you would never hear people talking about high repetition training, even though I knew it worked because yeah. it worked on me, right? And it worked on my clients. Over the years, more recent years, there's more and more proven study data to come out that high rep training can have huge benefits. But I don't recommend you training like that all of the time. Mm -hmm. I am an advocator of three-dimensional training. I'm an advocator of balanced diet, which means three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So um, um, some of my clients may be doing three, week one, week one, week one, week two, week three. Some of my clients might be week one, week two, week two, week three. Some of my clients yeah. might be two week ones, one week uh, two, two week threes. Yeah. But remember, in order for me to design that program, they have to be a client of mine because I need to get that data. Yeah. And then you need to be able to track the data. And those clients then obviously need to put that information into their check-in so I can see what areas that we need to manipulate when their training style is concerned. And um, you know as well as anybody that when it comes to Olympia prep, the level of intensity goes up, mm -hmm. right? And yes, there's an element of cardio. But if your element of output in the gym goes up, your need and requirement to do cardio goes down. Mm -hmm. When have we ever done three hours of cardio a day, <laughs> two hours of cardio Never. a day, one and a half hours? Never. Yeah. Yeah. All right? So we can manipulate you know, fat loss or calorific expenditure or hormone output very efficiently just through our training stimulus but it was only it was only there because i had to train like that because of my injuries yeah. it was for no other reason would i still advocate a th you know a, a micro cycle training like something like y3t to everybody yes because we've all got different muscle fibers yeah. so yeah. it's important nobody is dominating one in all muscle groups yeah. so yes for those reasons in the same way I don't think any nutritionist would say you just eat chicken and rice every day. Well, right. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, your training, the, 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 the stimulus, the training style is based on the requirements of what individuals need and require. And, I, and you know now, you came up with the idea of it. Mm. You came up, because to me it was like, no, the idea is just for us to grow, yeah. right? And move forward. But it was Flex who brought it to the, you know, to the marketplace indirectly. Well, the, the idea was your, I mean, the idea was just me saying to put a name to it. Yeah. The to training style it. was that. Yeah, yeah. And to that, 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 that was the only creation that I mm. could put together and was like, hey, this is the, I, I think you need to put this out to the marketplace because people are asking me, mm -hmm. you know, interviewers are asking me and, and we just need to have a, uh, a name to put to this. So it wasn't, as you said, like a, a marketing idea or a concept of, um, 
you know, oh, we're we going to do this, that, and the other, which the majority of mm-hmm. training styles are, right? Mm-hmm. Let's put a name to this system, market the share of it, and then we can sell the ebook or whatever else. Um, with this, it was just, fuck, we don't have a name. I need something to tell fucking Flex Magazine, mm-hmm. you know? Um, because, again, this has been years and years and years put together, and mm-hmm. it was just about time that, you know, this was... This was just cr- fucking created. A name was created. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said, you have a fantastic product line that's been put together with your name, the Neil Hill Signature Line, Yamamoto, obviously a, a sponsor of both you and I, incredible supplement company, uh, core values on that, where they source their ingredients, the second and none. There's nothing on the market like Yamamoto, nothing. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., obviously, it comes from the same one, two, three places. Yamamoto sourced their ingredients from overseas, Japan, along with Europe. You've created a line that is within a line, right? Mm. Um, and that's because of your training style, what you feel the industry is lacking. Um, can you tell us how the brainchild of this came about? Well... <laughs> I obviously got introduced with Yamamoto, obviously, through yourselves. And then, obviously, when you sit down and look at their formulations and the, the products that they use and active rules, say from, for, for instance, from Japan, Kauai quality, there's nothing which comes close. To, it is the pinnacle of everything, right? You start to realize that this company is way above everybody, above everybody else. I think the only negative about Yamamoto as a an individual to buy product, they probably have 180 products. So yeah. there's so much choice, right, that people become confused. Yeah. But the benefit is, is that people have different needs and requirements. And they're also, don't forget, they're a pharmaceutical, nutraceutical product line. So there are people which have health issues. So they obviously fill that gap. They sell us in okay. pharmacies and it does. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's just crazy what you see. And of course, we were naive to this until we... We sense and seen seen it for ourselves. Yeah. So, Flex obviously had the Flex line, and then obviously conversation started, and they actually said to me that they want to bring a product line with me, mm-hmm. but I wanted to bring a product line that I felt was non-conflicting already, and a, a product line which would synergistically work along Flex's line, and a product line that I really truly believed in, and and forever I've always pushed and promoted hydration as one of the most critical areas of injury prevention, recovery, muscle growth development. Um, and even though they had a hydration product within the company, it was based on coconut water, they still have it there now. I felt that we need to fill a void for the athlete. Mm. And I also wanted a product which was completely non-stim, but was going to aid with the sense of anabolism and support fat loss, and people could take multiple, multiple times of the day, but also be used as a potential um, pre- or intra-workout supplement. And the only reason I say that, it wasn't based around intra or pre for stimulus. It was based around blood flow. So there's obviously Kauai quality, um, four grams of Kauai Kauai quality, um, L-citrulline in there. So that was where the element of, say, um, pre-workout came from. But the great thing about taking that first thing in the morning or or in the evening based around your cardio, you're not going to get a high from it. You're not going to have any issues sleeping. You're going to see an increase in thermogenism because of obviously green tea extract, rhodiola rosa in there as well for brain function activation. The increase in blood flow is going to aid response when it comes to recovery because even though when you do cardio, you're not doing it to impact or increase the risk of catabolism. You want to make sure that you are shuttling nutrients around the body at the same time as well. So the product line was based around the essence of recovery, growth, development, fat loss. My, um, I'm, I'm proud of all my products. All right, I will say this, the Hydro Elite, there's nothing on the marketplace which comes near it. Fucking okay. taste is incredible. Okay, too. but my Infusion <sighs> Elite... Like, that is the shit. Yeah. yeah. Because it is a post-training protein. So when we look at Peptobol, okay, Peptopro from Yamamoto, it's a hydrolyzed casein. 
super, super. It's the fastest digesting protein in the world. Ditripeptide blends, okay? Um, it's going to get in your system super responsive. You're not going to have... The great thing about that product compared to anything else on the on the marketplace is that you could take that as a pre or intra protein and you're not going to have any gastric emptying issues, not going to have any gastric issues unless you have any, any underlying issues, right? It's great on me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It works on you. We I'm use the it all the time. Yeah. Right? I'm the fucking yeah. boss the boy for gut health. Yeah, yeah. So, so that it's a great protein. But my vision was is because it's not a complete protein, in order to increase a higher sense of anabolism and Increase in, say, protein synthesis for a longer length of time. I wanted something which was filling voids. So within the Infusion Elite, we have hydrolyzed casein, hydrolyzed whey isolate. We have whey isolate coming through the form of, and these are all um, grass-fed proteins yeah. coming in here, all right? Um, and, and as far as the uh, whey isolate that we use, it comes through the form of Infusion Elite. Uh, it's already comes through the form of isofuji, which is yeah. by far, by far, the best way isolate on the marketplace. It's microfiltered, yeah, and it's um, it's it, it it is just such an incredible way isolate. All right, and then we also have GMO free egg white protein. So it's a blend Morning. of proteins, and yes, it does taste absolutely incredible. Yeah, it yeah. mixes incredible, but let's just take away all of those things. Chocacino. Chocchino. It's an incredible, incredible product. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, um, and of course, I want to be able to have the ability to add, you know, more products, but also making sure like it, it doesn't contradict something else mm -hmm. and that the essence of everything. And I'm incredibly proud of it. I'm, um, I, besides seeing you guys performing on stage, all right. And, and even it's not just about yourselves because I think that some of my, best success that I see with me as a coach or feel I've achieved is not always about seven Olympia wins being a part of your journey, mm -hmm. but it could be, I could be working with somebody who's just lost 120 pounds. It's life changing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's life changing and it's, it's life changing on multiple different levels. You're a healthy individual. We never abused anything, right? Mm -hmm. We had a goal, we had a vision, but we all stay true, right? Health balance achievement and we're very lucky to achieve that or you're very lucky to achieve that do i think the bodybuilding is taking years away from me i don't think so i, I personally don't think I, I personally don't think so because when we look at blood work over all those years there was never a time where we thought oh my gosh right mm -hmm. yeah. okay but nobody's got a crystal ball but these people which had just lost 100 pound 120 pound now we pretty much guarantee that they put multiple multiple years on their lives right yeah, yeah. Life so life changing so yeah. that to me is a massive achievement. Seeing these individuals achieve these changes is life changing. Seeing the the, the 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 success with my athletes or the new athletes which are coming up because I've got a strong team of athletes. But the product line to me is definitely one of the things which I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of. And, and I'm, pr I'm proud of it for many reasons. I feel very lucky mm. that I'm a part of a company that gives so much back to the industry and sponsorship. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they support so many shows around the world, you know, so I feel that their intentions, are, you know, are very, very good in itself. So I'm proud. I'm excited. Yeah. And, and this um, didn't come overnight, too. It wasn't no. like you no. came to them, uh, you went to that, they came to you, vice versa, and said, hey, this is an idea. You were working on this for about a year and a half. It was two years. Two years. To the, yeah. you know, to, to I remember. Yeah, yeah. Concept to us yeah. getting, you know, obviously there's, a lot of people don't understand, too, the process that they goes with something like this. There's a lot of R&D, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of things that go through a company of that that of that of structure that takes time. Yep. This isn't a small mom and pop thing, so it's like, hey, here's my idea, okay, let's put it in manufacturing, come in back, give it to me in the six weeks time. Mm -hmm. No, two years, as you said, where there was a sit down, a conversation, nothing, but that didn't mean nothing, it was just shit moving forward, mm -hmm. it was just, takes time to get something of this magnitude, get the ingredients sourced, pricing it out, making sure that it all works together and it's, you know, approved by you. So uh, this is for me to see this uh, being used all around the world, athletes in many different sports, just not in, in bodybuilding, um, tagging me and tagging you in and, you know, 
just saying how great it is. That's that's a proud moment for me as your friend, as you know, as an athlete under you. Because I remember every single conversation you've had with me, from whether it's athlete success to how you starting with somebody to then winning their shows. You've got a great rostrum of new athletes that are coming through the rank, incredibly talented future Olympian athletes, guys that you've been working with from amateur to pro. And um, yeah, there's the f- the future is is very bright for you, mate. And is there any projects that you're working on right now that you want to tell the viewers before we wrap up? I don't think so. I mean, uh, there are a lot. There are projects that I w- uh, projects that I want to work on, yeah. and, and just like my time is just so limited. So I said I was going to bring an ebook to the marketplace like the end of last year, this year. Flex, I don't have time to get on there, right? But so, you have uh, few already, right? Sorry, you've got a several. Oh uh, yeah, but already. I wanted to bring my 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 Bible of pre-contest prep. Mm. I wanted to bring a pre-contest prep, That's and this cool. and this was going to be uh, like I would say the the best ebook I ever ever did by far. And I was going to only bring it to the marketplace. You know, I want to do something which is like which is just the shit. You understand? It's the yeah. Bible, yeah. and I can't release anything until it is that way. So. If it happens in six months, it happens six six months. You know, there's been a lot of distraction because obviously bought a house in Vegas and all these things yeah. and everything's yeah. ongoing, right? So yeah. there's a lot of distraction taking place. But um, I suppose at the moment, my focus is just on Olympia prep. I've got travel coming up as well. So I just kind of like I have to stay present now at the moment. Um, there are things that I'm excited that I want to move forward on, but I've got to get these chapters finished first right. before I can move on to the next thing. Otherwise, it's easy to get sidetracked. How many athletes you have in this year's Olympia? Um, four or five this year going into the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, four or five athletes going into this year's show. I've got a strong. I I, got, I turned down actually two really incredible athletes um, who reached out to me, which I feel that they had the ability to win their mm. divisions. But with all the issues going on with my house and the distraction, I just didn't. I couldn't take on that commitment. Whereas I love that kind of pressure, but yeah, I've got a I've got a, got a good team of athletes going on to this year's show. Obviously, Brand is um, going into this year to um, obviously try and get the trifecta, you know, to, just to basically solidify himself. You know, as as um, holding that title and defending it again. Um, we put you know Cody's just gone into off season, rested up. He had a good season. I've got Alex Cambarero, Mike Summerlin. Um, or um, Oswaldo, I'm excited about Oswaldo. He's got a really great, pretty blend of everything. His first time on, on on stage, so I think for him this year, seeing him qualify and winning that show is very rewarding because you genuinely see their faces of, of, of like it's a dream come true, right? Yeah. yeah, it's an absolute dream come true. The other athletes, they've already been there, right? But yeah. and he probably thought that he had this dream. And maybe he thought it wouldn't happen, but it has happened, right? Yeah. Mm. And being a part of that or seeing it and the expression, it's a fucking reward in itself. Yeah. So, you know, everything's personal. You know how I am. Um, you know, we, we're going to Vegas. We're here in Vegas and we're going to, you know, we're going to bring something to our very best ability. So as long as everything keeps moving in the right direction, um, I pulled Brandon back a little bit because his body was not, it wasn't running away, but like, we could be ready in two or three weeks, mm. Mm. right? And his body's super fresh, super fresh. So, um, got to just focus on them now. Well, I'm very excited. You know, we've been very lucky to see many athletes that have come through the thre- threshold of this gym, all the, the amateur athletes, all the pro athletes that you've been working on. And um, there's nothing better than them all ranting and raving about how good you are as a coach you know starting your journey from tembi now you've got 45 pro wins four on our classic titles nine up until the point of this film in olympia wins you know undoubtedly one of the greatest coaches in the fitness industry my coach my friend neil hill it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here on straight out there is there any parting words you want to say before you Jump on off? Um, no, because I think I'll get emotional. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. And um, no, because there's 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 a lot of uh, you know there's there's a lot to our relationship, right? And I think that um, unless you, it's not about the achievements, but 
you, we probably haven't even spoken on, we haven't even spoken about anything that I thought we would speak about. Yeah. Mm. You know, so for you, the viewer, I apologize if it wasn't the insight that you wanted. Um, you know, I don't even think I've, I spoke about, we spoke about anything I thought we would spoke about. Like I just said, there were elements. Mm. So I think like, you know, this is a, you know, the real core of us hasn't even been touched upon. Oh, no Not doubt. even slightly. Not but even this, in, this, you know. But the great thing is about you living in Vegas and me having the podcast, you at the gym. Mm-hmm. It's always a fucking part too. <laughs> <laughs> so the great thing is about you, me, Ali, I get to see you. My kids get to see you. We get to have, you know, Uncle Neil in our lives because we had a, a long part of our relationship that was from overseas, over the phone, over WhatsApp. Um, but now we truly all get to, you know, enjoy, you know, life in, in the stage it is right now, reminisce. And uh, I get to see you live through your dreams as a coach, just getting better, seeing you have more wins, open up doors to bigger superstar clients um i know we didn't touch on a lot of in this podcast but believe it or not it's been two fucking hours already wow yeah, yeah. so Sorry, guys so again we haven't touched the surface and i think it's it's definitely a part two uh this probably was more of a a serious note talking about you know a lot of different things but fuck me we we got some stories <laughs> we leave that for another time <laughs> <laughs> But we got some great ones. That's no no doubt in that. We haven't even scratched the surface on so many. I know that there's many stories that uh, we haven't even never talked about that are absolutely hilarious. I think it's going to be a part two, no fucking question. So for all the viewers watching this, appreciate it, guys. If you haven't already checked out Y three T. It's available on I mean there's so many stuff out there. Where's what's the website for you for them well, to check I've out never stuff? launched my website, right? So oh, I've right. never had a I've got a great website, you've seen it, but yeah. I've never launched it. Because COVID came, this mm. happened. It's like I can't launch this until I know I have the time for it. Mm. So I would just say just check out my Instagram. Obviously you've got my Instagram yeah. account. Um the stuff on YouTube of Y three T as well, right? Yeah there's obviously and then I pr- next year I'm gonna do a lot of content. I just need to sort these things out and then I can put my energy and effort into those things because I feel that people haven't seen really what they need to see. You understand? Well, there's there's a circumstance that's happening right now, but once that is taken care of, I know that that time is going to be very widely open to you. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's 100% going to be a part two, so maybe we'll continue on that part two whenever, you know, the world opens up Mm -hmm. and... uh, a lot of exciting new things are coming your way. And, and I'm very excited to be privy on some of these things. And watch this fucking space. That's all I'm going to say. Anything parting words for you? No. All right, Neil? <laughs> I love you guys very much and I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you, man. We love you too. Flex Lewis, straight out the lair. Out.